so many scriptures and they're scattered you know that they're scattered you know the lord's been talking about the end times ever since um even in the days of job i mean job talked about the resurrection he said even though the flesh worms eat my body i know that i shall one day see god for myself amen i'm looking for that button to stop my video there we go that way we'll have more bandwidth going to uh quality audio and so uh and again, you know, when you're reading Deuteronomy or you're reading Psalms, you know, you'll come across an end times prophecy, the book of Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they all mention a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And um, then you get to the New Testament and it gets a lot clearer. There's a lot more detail. In fact, I'm going to spend most of my time in the New Testament because a lot of the Old Testament deals with international affairs about this country attacking that country. And that's not really a big issue for me, you know, Gog and Magog and, and Shushan and, and a lot of the things that are going to be going on, they're great for um, making it evident that God didn't know a long time ago what was going to be happening today. So those are very good. There's lots of uh, prophecy um, TV shows that actually do talk a lot about this to give confidence to the word of God as, as a reliable source of world events and truth and that there really is a god but i do like to spend my time mostly on just the the end times that are most relevant to us now the funny thing is really if you're a believer the only thing that's relevant to us really is this direct rapture and so of course um there's a variation of beliefs on when the rapture happens and so we have to kind of get a bit more involved and look at more of the picture so we can say yes we feel quite convinced that the rapture happens at this point and not at that point. As so many people think the rapture happens at the beginning of the tribulation, something that happens in the middle, something that happens at the end. We call them pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. And uh, then some people even say that there's not going to be a millennial reign of Christ, a 1,000-year reign of Christ. In fact, I did, I did purchase one time about 10 copies of a CD series talking about the end times, but this guy was a Presbyterian, a very popular Presbyterian. I think it might have been Charles MacArthur or Stanley MacArthur or something like that, a very popular teacher. But I listened to them first, and they were absolutely pathetic. I mean, absolutely every prophecy, it seemed like, was going to occur all on one day, and he was cool with that. And I don't know how it's possible he can expect a rapture, the tribulation, the revelation, the millennium, the, you know, all of these things, all the seven vials, the seven um, seals, all those judgments of God being poured out in one day. Um, but the Bible does talk about, um, you know, the day, of, the day of God, the day of Christ. And many times the word day can be used in reference to a period of time. And I believe that he's actually gone a bit literal with that. But that word totally messed up. I had to send them all back. And if I couldn't send them back, I was going to burn them. They were, I couldn't sell them. They were hideous. So people do weave a terrible mess. And so let's hope we can untangle it. Amen. So let's just take a look at how difficult this possibly can be. Now, in Matthew 13, 49, it says, So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. That's pretty neat. At the end of the world. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Revelations 19, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So you might be asking, okay, how... Do I know which one comes first? You know, they're in different books of the Bible and, uh, and there's not much of a context. And here's a real funny one too. I was talking to Sister Louisa about this on Sunday. First Thessalonians 5, 2. Paul says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Oh, okay, so when Jesus comes, no one's gonna see him. Then Revelation 1, 7 says, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And so we're thinking, wait, so is he going to come as a thief and no one's going to see him? Or is he going to come in the clouds and every eye shall see him? And I assure you, 
if we still have TVs in the millennium, you're going to have probably a copy of the, the, the Revelation of Jesus Christ in your DVD collection. Because I believe every eye is going to see him, and I think it's going to be made possible with TV or whatever other version we have there. Okay. Again, you can ask questions, but I just want to show that uh, you can be looking at various scriptures and see a big difference and say, okay, how do I put this together? I'm sure the Bible is without error. How can we weave it together? And what I like to do is I like to um, just at the very beginning let you know that uh, the Lord returneth twice. Okay. The first time we call it the rapture. Now the Bible doesn't use the word rapture. It's a Latin term from those uh, raptorious birds, those birds that kind of swoop down and they scoop up a mouse or they scoop up a fish out of the water. Those are called raptorial birds. And so they've used this um, term to the, the, the second coming of Jesus when he comes as a thief in the night because the Lord, he's returning for his bride, which is the church. The Lord does not set foot on earth at the rapture. And the dead in Christ are raised as well. So, you know, when he comes down, he doesn't come all the way down. He kind of comes down close. And the Christians are aware we hear a trumpet. We hear a voice. And I suspect maybe no one else hears it. Maybe they might hear thunder. But he's not going to reach the ground. And we're going to be resurrected. And the dead in Christ are going to be resurrected as well. And then he's going to take us away. He's going to be a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. And then the second time is called the revelation. Now, the Bible does use the word revelation. And so it talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ or when Jesus is revealed. And so we can use that term as a biblical term. This is when the Lord returns for the Jews, right. believing Jews, of course. And the Lord, he does set foot on Mount Zion. He actually does touch the earth. So in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus left and the angel said, as you see him leave, you shall so see him come again. This is that time. And, of course, when he does come down, the battle of Armageddon is fought and won. In an instant, every eye shall see him. In fact, at that moment, it's going to be an exciting moment because all of the armies of the world are going to be gathered around Israel mm. and every weapon is going to be pointed at Israel. And Israel it might be a Hail Mary pass, as we say in football terms, but they're going to call out to Messiah wow. and Messiah is going to answer. Mm. And that's when Israel, all Israel believes. Remember, I think it's in Romans 8. Paul says, and all Israel shall be saved. He's talking about that time. When, yeah. when Jesus comes down, they're going to see the Messiah whom they pierced, and they're going to be shocked because they definitely weren't expecting him. And, um, and it then it says, all Israel shall be saved. And so that's, that begins what's called the millennium, but we'll get to that. So there's two second comings. There's the secret silent coming, and then there's the visible, loud, in-your-face Revelation when Jesus comes and he conquers the world by force and then he rules a 1,000 year reign of peace. Amen. So we'll get into the story. We're going to follow the storyline in Revelation. Now, Revelation is roughly sequential. There are some passages that make it quite clear there's going to be some overlap. But it, the story in Revelation, I'd like to follow it because it's a really good chart. Revelation chapter 1 is this John's introduction to this series of Revelations. In verse 3, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And so there's a blessing in reading the book of Revelation. There's a blessing in hearing the book of Revelation. And so we need to, you know, read this. I know it's pictorial. There's lots of pictures, and there's lots of blood and gore, and, and people dying, and rivers turning to blood, and beasts crawling out. Of this. And so hopefully... We can say, okay, this is going to be prophecy. It's not going to be fully understandable, but um, but there's a blessing behind it. God has get put a blessing in the book of Revelation. We're going to read it. In fact, what's funny is I, I think it happens to a lot of Christians. They become a Christian. They say, I'm going to read the Bible. And then they go to the most ex exciting book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And then they read the book of Revelation and they see, you know, stars falling out of heaven and beasts crawling out of the oceans and oceans turning to blood and they think man is the whole bible full of all this prophecy stuff that's so hard to understand and so it can be discouraging i don't recommend people read the book of revelation first as it's so pictorial you might get bogged down and not read any of the bible but the bible is so much more readable than that i always say start with the gospels and work your way in start with maybe the gospel of matthew or the gospel of john and and work your way through 
and then there's the book of Acts, and then there's epistles, and it's so digestible, so understandable, but Revelation was meant not to be fully understood, so that's why it can be a little frustrating. We like to understand everything we read. And in verse 19, when Jesus appeared to John, he says, write the things which thou hast seen, which is in chapter 1, and the things which are, which would be chapters 2 and 3, and the things which shall be hereafter, which is what we're going to read in chapters 4 to 22. So that's sort of how we can package up the book of Revelation. There's the, the day that, that John had his revelation, chapter 1, and then there's going to be letters to churches, chapters 2 to 3. Then there's all the apocalyptic world coming to an end stuff, chapters 4 to 22. Now let's go to chapters 2 and 3. There were seven churches that John was instructed to write letters to, but I'm sure he wrote those letters and he delivered those letters. Those letters were written to churches that were going through situations, but we've also been able to see a pattern that this follows church history. Like the book of Ephesus yes, represents right. the, the apostolic church, the first church of 33 AD to 130. Smyrna talks about the persecuted church from 100 to 313 AD. And then Pergamos is the married church. That's when the church was actually joined up to the government and it got watered down. And then there's Thyatira after the uh, Roman Catholic theology really got deep and, and dug in. Um, the word Thyatira means continual sacrifice, you know. So now Jesus is being sacrificed again and again and again every time they have... Um, they're, they call it, they, they call it communion. I know we call it communion. They call it uh, mass. That's right. They, have, they call it mass. And they say that the bread actually turns into the body of, of Jesus and the grape juice actually turns into the blood of Jesus. And so they're continually sacrificing Jesus. We call that the religious church. And then Sardis is the remnant church. As, as, as believers came out of the religious church, they began to revive doctrines. And then there's the Church of Philadelphia. That word is Greek for brotherly love. And we call that the missionary church because then um, after the Christians got themselves established, they revived many of the doctrines of the original church. They began crossing the oceans and taking the gospel to every island, every nook, every cranny. And uh, they, they made it to Japan. They made it to, uh, to China. They made it to the, the islands. Amen. And then Laodicea. This is what we call the rebellious church because Laodicea, Laos means people and Decea means ruling. It's kind of like the mob rules. That's one way of retranslating that word Laodicea into English, mob rules. And there's many churches now where the mob rules, the pastor has to tickle the ears of the church because they can vote them out if they want to. Now, of course, we, um, we do have voting and we do have, um, what do you call it, uh, a bit of a democracy in our church as well. But um, but it's not where like a pastor has to live in fear and make sure he tickles the ears of the people. In fact, uh, our Pentecostal church is kind of like it when the pastor doesn't always rub people on the head and say good. But he challenges us. We need to be challenged. Amen. I always say find a church that will challenge you to be the best person you could possibly be rather than just telling you you're fine. I used to go to a church that used to tell me I'm fine. Oh, everything's okay. The pastor would say everything's great. God loves you. You're you're, you're covered. God's got your back, you know, and, and many of the people he was talking to, God didn't have their back because they didn't even know how to be saved. In fact, after I became a Christian, I went back and visited that church and gave him a track and tried to win him to Jesus. And he actually added it to his track collection because he was collecting tracks. So I do believe that these were real churches, but they do represent 2000 years of church history. And it hasn't been 2000 years yet. You know, the church was born about AD 33, the death of Jesus. And we're only about maybe 2,000 in, or maybe 1,987 years later. So who knows, maybe God's waiting for the exact number 2,000 to take us away, or maybe not, but we're close to it. So this is how we sort of interpret uh, the things that are. Okay, this is the things that are. This is the ages of the church leading up until... Um, Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the church is not to be confused with the Jews, for we are not New Testament Jews or spiritual Jews. In fact, um, Sister Linda Matlab, if you have your Bible, can you look up 1 Corinthians 10, 32? 
1 Corinthians 10.32. I'll be needing that in a second. So many times people say, oh, we're spiritual Jews. And actually we're not. Paul, whenever Paul was talking about spiritual Jews, he was talking about Jews in the church who were saved. And so he wasn't talking about Christians. Christians don't become Jews. We don't become spiritual Jews. We are spiritual Gentiles. Amen. And furthermore, the Jews in the Old Testament are not to be confused with the church as the Jews were the Old Testament church. And the church are New Testament Jews. You know, they do that. In fact, one of the Bibles I had, the commentary in the top, even in the book of Psalms, says the church rejoices. The church this and the church that because the person is trying to create this singular blob called the people of God and put them all in one group. But Sister Linda, what does 1 Corinthians 10.32 say? Or maybe Brother Brian, if you can get that verse for me. Hello. Sorry. No worries. First <laughs> your Corinthians, I just didn't find, couldn't find where the mic was. Sorry. Okay. Chapter 10, verse 32. 10, 32. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. 10, 1 Thessalonians, chapter, what was it, chapter? First Corinthians, chapter oh, 10. Sorry. No worries. Thank you. There is no 10 in there. The first Corinthians, chapter 10. Yes. Verse uh, it says, Give none, of, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Okay, so that's how Paul viewed humanity. There's three groups. There's Jews, there's Gentiles, and there's a church. And so even though the church existed and the church had saved Gentiles and it had saved Jews, he still considered the Jews to be a category of humanity because God still had a plan for them. And, uh, and so we still say there's Jews, there's Gentiles, and there's the church. And my goal, of course, is to get as many people as possible into the church because Jews are always better off in the church rather than waiting for the end times. You don't want to be left behind. In fact, I would say that if we could sum up the book of Revelation in five words, it would be, you must be born again. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to stay around for the tribulation and see if you can survive. It's not an obstacle course. It's not a, a Iron Man competition. It's, it's going to be hell on earth. It's going to be tribulation. It's going to be terrible. So God has different plans for each group. And the church is mentioned 18 times in Revelations 1 to 3. And it's not mentioned again until Revelations 22 when we return to the present. And, and John continues the discussion he began in, John chapter, in Revelation chapter 1. So what happens in Revelation chapter 4? After talking about the church in chapters 2 and 3, Revelation 4, 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet. Remember that trumpet. A trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So for me, John is being called up hither, but I think this is like a type of the rapture. Um, and we'll take a look at the rapture here in Matthew 24. And he says, and they knew not those who were eating and drinking and and marrying and giving in marriage. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. So this is, to me, I believe, uh, a reference to the rapture, because again, from this point forward, you don't hear of the church again by name. And so the, it was church, 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 for all through Revelations 2 and 3, and then come up hither and no more mention of the church. And that's the way it's going to be on the earth. The earth is going to be void of the church. Mm -hmm. it, it would come up. Okay. So continuing in 1 Thessalonians 14, a more, the, the most, this is our, our favorite poster child reference to the rapture. Paul says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That you sorrow not, and he's talking about those who died in faith before now. That you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Remember the trumpet? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Mm -hmm. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, because Jesus is not coming down. He's only coming down to just low enough to pick us up. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So the rapture is when God comes to take the church away. He takes all of those who have uh, died in faith and they're resurrected or given resurrected bodies. And then those who are alive until the coming of Jesus will be resurrected right there at that very moment. They won't even need to die, which is very convenient. Amen. Nobody wants to die. We all want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And so those who are in that lucky group, amen, will be able to say to the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, yeah, I was raptured. And we're going to like, you know, I'm sure we're going to be the envy. It's like driving a Mustang, you know, we're going to be the envy. Now, continuing, there's more. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 15. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, we call this the resurrection chapter. So if you want to learn more about the resurrection, heaps of information in 1 Corinthians 15. But at the end of the chapter, Paul says this. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, which means resurrection. Resurrected for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this immortal must put on immortality. That's such a rich chapter. I recommend you hunt down chapter 15 and read the whole thing. Amen. It's loaded. Amen. Now... After this rapture moment, we have a scene in heaven. We get to look around a little bit. In verse 2, he says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. Nothing to see, really. Just sort of a, a shimmery glow. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, I think these 24 elders might be representatives of the church and of Israel, because there are 12 tribes of Israel, and there are 12 apostles. So this might be either 24 uh, men, but I think it might be actually talking about the entire Jewish and Christian believers gathered around the throne. Um, and it says the four and twenty elders fall down before him and sat on the throne and that sat on the throne and worship him that lived forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now here's an interesting thing. As you can see, on the throne, we know God's there, but there's nothing to see really. Mm -hmm. And in first Timothy 3.16, it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, and seen of angels. Now, the angels never saw God before right. until they saw Jesus. Amen. So, Because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So when the angels saw Jesus, they saw God for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, a really neat revelation there because, you know, the, he doesn't have a physical or even a spiritual visage to be seen. Amen. Sorry, by the week, by the week, what, 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 Jeremiah, was it? Jeremiah? Uh, the one you were just reading. Revelation 4, 10. Yeah. So this, uh, it was 1 Timothy 3.16. Oh, and then Revelation. Oh, okay. Sorry. No worries. I love questions. In fact, before we move on, does anyone have any questions up to this point? We have the church age followed by the rapture, followed by the church, and the Jews being gathered together. Just going back to Revelation chapter 1, Pastor. Yeah. Um, 
the first sentence there, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. That gives the outline of what this book is all about. And I think a lot of people bypass that and don't really understand what that means. Mm -hmm. they, they will not remember that the revelation of Jesus Christ is a certain coming. Mm -hmm. and yeah. It's not always, and, and all the rest of it that happened from chapter 1 to chapter 20, 22, um, it needs to happen because it's prophecy. Yeah. And the other the other point I was going to say, Pastor, in Ephesians chapter 2 with the Ephesians church, and um, this probably has no context what, what you're talking about, but Paul actually spent three years in, in the Ephesians and... Um, in, in the book of Acts, I think it's in uh, Acts 19, and uh, he had a great influence on the Ephesian church there as well, I think, during that time. But this is just a comic, couple of comics there, that's all. Yeah, those were some, mm -hmm. were some anchors for churches. And I thought it was kind of funny, even as a young believer, I opened up to the book of Revelation, it says in really big print, the revelation of John. And then the <laughs> words say the revelation of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. <laughs> which God gave to him to pass on to us, you know. So yeah. I thought it was kind of a funny um, shift. And John recorded it maybe, but it was actually a revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to share. Mm -hmm. This is what we're allowed to understand, and there's a blessing on it. Thank you, brother. So chapter four, we had a look of what's going on in heaven, and then we go to chapter five, and it says, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne, Although, of course, you couldn't see a hand or the person, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And, of course, they couldn't find anybody, and John begins to cry. And one of the elders saith unto him, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So there's so much content there that can be chopped apart and looked around. But of course, that's not really the focus of our topic here. We're just sort of looking at the timeline. So again, this book, I believe, is going to be sort of God's justification. He's been holding back judgment that, that this earth and the people of this earth have been accumulating. He's been holding it back for many people to be saved. And so it's time to pour out this wrath because justice needs to be served in order for everyone to be saved. And so the tribulation begins breaking out on earth. Revelations chapter 6, there's the first seal where a king comes conquering the earth. They, pour, they break the second seal. It says, peace is taken from the earth. This is just a really big summary. Very, very brief. The third seal, the economy is destroyed on earth. The fourth seal is broken. Sword and hunger kill 25% of life. And at the fifth seal, the souls of martyrs cry for vengeance. So during this period of time, people are standing up for God and they're being martyred. They're resisting the new world order and they're being uh, murdered and they're under the uh, altar, Christ saying, Lord, when will you uh, bring vengeance? And he says, there's still some more. Hang in there. And then the sixth seal, I wanted to quote some scripture for that one. We're in Revelation chapter 6. It says in verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and Bill Gates and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Now, what does that sound like to you? It's total rupture, like the whole world's end. Isn't it yeah, it sounds like the earth is, I think, they're, they're, I think they're dropping nuclear bombs all yeah, over the place. Over the, the place. heavens are, are, are being rolled back like a scroll. The mountains and islands are being shaken out of their places. And people who can afford it are hiding in Even bomb shelters. And so I just thought that's a, a really revealing 
passage there that John should be able to describe bombs dropping out of the sky with such incredible precision. He saw this, but he probably couldn't put words to it. Um, well, he did. He could he put words to it, but he didn't understand the technology behind it. Amen. So tribulation on earth, again, the Antichrist um, isn't, hasn't revealed himself as the Antichrist yet. He probably is the king that we're talking about here. He's a king conquering the earth, and he's bringing peace. He's bringing his fake peace, which of course is not peace. And, um, and everything's falling apart under his, and God's pouring out judgment as well. And so it talks in Revelation chapter 7 about 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Because you have to remember, with uh, the church being taken away, there's no one to, to speak up for God. And so it says in Revelation chapter 7, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Now the Holy Ghost is the seal of our salvation in this dispensation. The Sabbath was the seal of salvation in uh, the, the Mosaic Covenant. So every covenant with God has a seal and a token. Now I don't know what the token is going to be in the uh, end times. It might be baptism in Jesus' name. But he has a seal. We don't know what the seal is. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then it mentions which tribes. And so these evangelists, I believe, are going to be specially anointed. They're going to get a revelation, and they're going to begin preaching the, the truth of God. They're going to be holding the New Testament they're going to be reading Revelation and Matthew, because Matthew 24 talks quite a bit about the end times too. And they're going to begin um, putting two and two together. And they're going to begin preaching, but it's not going to be a welcome message. The, the world economy is going to be resisting what they're preaching, and they're going to be killing them. Revelation chapter 8. <coughs> now the seventh seal is seven trumpets. So the last judgment of the seals is actually seven more ju judgments and they're called trumpets it says when the first angel blew a trumpet hail fire and blood came down and the trees and the grass were burnt when the second angel blew a trumpet 33 percent of the sea becomes blood 33 percent of the sea life dies and 33 percent of the ships are destroyed when the third trumpet is blown wormwood falls into the sea and many die and the fourth trumpet um, 33% of the sky is dark and the sun, the moon, and the stars can't be seen one a third of the time. The fifth trumpet, locusts from this bottomless pit come out and they torment humans. They don't kill, but they torment and they bring terrible pain. In fact, it even says people will be wishing they could die, but death will be deprived of them. And then the sixth trumpet, it says 200,000 horsemen will come um, out of the Euphrates. Now it's not talking about real soldiers, it's talking about probably another pestilence, like the locusts, and it will kill one third of all humans on the planet. So it's gonna be some other, I don't know if it's gonna be some sort of bug, some super bug, as the, the first one, these locusts, you know, have uh, like hair of a woman and this tail of a uh, scorpion. And so they talk about these, these two uh, critters, one that tortures and one that kills. And then we take a break, this is overlapping prophecy. Um, talk about the two prophets. You may have heard of the two prophets. And it says in verse 4, these are the two olive trees. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And that um, stopping of rain sounds like Elijah. And turning waters to blood sounds like Moses. Some people say to be Elijah and Moses. You know, one of the living prophets and one of the dead prophets coming back. Some people think, well, Enoch didn't die and Elijah didn't die. So maybe God's going to bring them back so they can die. So it's fun to speculate on that one there. But it sure sounds like Moses and Elijah. Going down to verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony after they've preached for three and a half years, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called sodom and egypt 
where also our Lord was crucified. So apparently Jerusalem is going to be turned into a real spiritual wicked cesspool. It's going to be hideous. It's going to be ungodly. And, uh, and that's where they're going to be going to preach. And that's where they're going to be killed. And it talks about people rejoicing over their death. In fact, people going to other people's houses and giving gifts and celebrating the fact that these two men are dead. And it says, after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, they're going to be resurrected. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. So again, that phrase, come up hither, is often a, um, a, a, a phrase spoken before a resurrection, before people are taken into heaven. And then it talks about the seventh trumpet. The temple of God is open in heaven, and they can see the Ark of His Testament is visible. So the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. Just like the tree of knowledge of good and evil, where did it go? It's in heaven. We see it in Revelation 22. Any questions? I can't guarantee I have all the answers. I'm just sharing your prophecy. Buster, Buster. Revelation 10, is that like giving like a definition of the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes to when people actually see him in Revelation 10? I don't think so. Um, it, you know, in um, 10, 1 to 3, I think, it, it says something about opening up a little book and he steps on the earth on his left foot and steps on the on the right foot to the to the sea. Yeah. I didn't mention that one. Revelation 10. I don't think it has anything to do with, with Jesus in particular. But I didn't want to, I, I, I definitely can't say that I understand that passage anyways. That's why I kind of skipped it. But, yeah. Oh, okay. But if you want to, you can read it to us and we can take a look at it. How's that sound? Okay, I'll read it. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with, with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it was the sun, and his feet as the pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. It's like very large. And, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. Uh, and when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Hmm. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Yeah, so I think there's, I think that was a revelation that's a little bit too clear for us to understand. I think God said that one should stay hidden. It wasn't one of the things he wanted to share with us, but he let John hear it. But I don't think it has anything to do with, um, I don't think it has much, I, I, again, I don't understand it, so I'm not going to speculate too much, but I don't think it was relevant, which is why I didn't include it. Mm. But I appreciate you bringing it up just in case. Okay? So I hope I... That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read more about it and, and, and search more about it. Good idea. Awesome. Okay, so Revelation 11 talks about the two prophets. They're preaching for the first three and a half years. The church is gone. The two prophets preach. And then the Jews are also in hiding. Let's see. Um, in Revelation chapter 12, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast into the earth. It sounds like Satan casting one third of the, of the angels and turning them into devils as they joined his revolution. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And Herod, of course, killed all the kids, trying to kill this baby. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, again, a three and a half year period of time. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about 
Jewish believers who are hiding from the dragon. Now, it doesn't mention the Antichrist here yet, so I believe this might be during the first part of the tribulation. So the two prophets are preaching, and there's a bunch of Jewish believers who have received the gospel, and they're hiding, and God's um, protecting them, but not giving them you know, total amnesty. So again, a bit of an overlapping here. Uh, again, the book of Revelation is not 100% sequential, but there's quite a few things where you have to sort of give us a bit of overlap. And then the beast and the false prophet, I believe they actually make their big show at the middle of the tribulation. I mean, the Bible says that they're going to be revealed before the rapture, but they're not really going to be posing themselves as the Messiah. He's going to pose himself as a great king and as a great leader and as a great peacemaker. But he's actually going to turn it around and say, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm the Messiah. I'm God. And that's going to happen halfway through. And, uh, and all the Jews who were on his side are then going to turn their back on him. And it's going to get ugly from there. Revelation 13, it says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Sea being uh, a type of people, all the people of the world, having seven heads and ten horns. So it looks like there's maybe... Ten nations and ten kings. Horns always represent kings and heads might be uh, centers of, uh, of nationality. And upon his horns were ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Mm -hmm. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over him, given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So he's definitely a world emperor now. And he's clamping down. And he says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Two beasts. Well, one is called the beast. And this one here is the false prophet. Right. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Mm -hmm. So we believe he's going to be a bit of a religious leader. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. So he's sort of a spokesman mm -hmm. for the beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that understand, that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now, right now, our governments are trying to say that you can't sell without an ABN and it's getting to be the point now where they're saying we're experimenting with turning off the cash let's just see if we can digitize everything and once they digitize it then they're going to say you know why bother with cash let's just go digital let's just put something maybe like a maybe they might go credit cards first and then when people start losing credit cards they'll say listen we'll put it in your head you can't lose your head and it's going to make a lot of sense I mean think about it you can't sell drugs if you have to do it digitally mm. and you can't steal money from people at gunpoint because it's on their chip. And so it's, it's going to make a lot of sense. It'll be brilliant. It'll be, yes, it'll be the, the, the solution to all crime on earth. What an incredible person. You know, and, and it says in the Bible, I forgot where it mentioned it, but it says when they cry out, peace, peace, then cometh great destruction. Because the Antichrist is claiming to be the Prince of Peace. Now, there's uh, two... Pastor. Yes, question time. Um, chapter 13, is that similar to Daniel 7? And they really saw the four beasts come up from the sea to diverse one from another? Yep, I believe so. Is that the, I, I have it in Daniel. I, I'd like to give, I'm afraid I might even start using Daniel when I, when I update this. I'll probably have the next page sort of a confirmation <laughs> of the beast and then mm. false prophet and other portions of scripture so we can see the, the harmony of the Old and New Testaments and other people. He yeah, talks about it in um, chapter, it was verse 3 to verse 8. 
Excellent. You are the you are the Daniel man. You know Daniel very well. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So Revelation chapter 14, two harvests. One, I thought I had an underline here. Oh yeah, that's right. Two harvests. Okay. Now it says, I looked and behold, a, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, those evangelists having his father's name written on their foreheads. That was the seal of, of God. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now, of course, we know that angels don't preach the gospel, but he's preaching this sort of big picture thing. Worship God. Don't worship the mark of the beast. And he goes off saying that if you worship the mark of the beast or take his number, you'll never make it to heaven. That's sort of the everlasting gospel the angels shed. So the angels never preached Acts 2.38 salvation. That's totally man's responsibility. We've got to do it. Yeah. But it says that he's um, preaching this everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of this judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, of course, how to worship God, you have to get a hold of one of those evangelists and I'll tell you how to do it. <coughs> and behold, I looked in a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like on the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. This is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. I believe this is reaping the righteous believers. Mm -hmm. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes, are fully ripe, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So sinners are likened to grapes, and I believe believers are likened to wheat in many parables. And so that's how we can see the first harvest is a harvest of the righteous, and the mm -hmm. second harvest is a harvest of the unrighteous, and that's actually happening at uh, the second the revelation of Jesus Christ, when Jesus comes to conquer the earth, by force. And then we go to Revelations 15 and 16. We learn about seven more judgments, the seven vials. The first vial is poured out upon the earth. And this is where God is just letting it rip. He says, this is the final judgment. This is going to finish the wrath. He says, when this is finished, it's over. The first vial, in fact, this might even happen within one week, this whole collection here. The first vial is poured out upon the earth. It says, sores will be upon those with the mark of the beast. And then the second vial is poured out and the sea becomes blood and all sea life dies. The third vial, the rivers and the fountains become blood. The fourth vial is poured out, sun scorches men with fire. And we've seen how easy that is, just destroy the ozone layer. And, and we're going to be vulnerable to the harshest rays of the sun that we have never known we're being protected from. The fifth vial, darkness upon the kingdom of the beast. The sixth vial, all armies are gathered in Armageddon. And the seventh vial, thunders, lightning, earthquakes. Again, islands fleeing, mountains falling, must be bombs dropping, and a plague of heavy hailstones. And so people are, are uh, again, they're cursing God because of this. They're not repenting of their sins, saying, I'm on the wrong side of the table here. But rather than repenting, they're just shaking their fists at heaven and cursing God for how it's happening. And then we have, um, in two successive chapters, Babylon is fallen. If you take a close look at this, the first Babylon in Revelation 17 is religious Babylon, and then Revelation 18 will be economic Babylon, or commercial Babylon. So Revelation 17, verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and, seven, and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. This is not fond admiration this is shocking admiration 
this is, you know, he's just, he's just totally shocked with how incredible her sins have. I mean, if you think about even just in our generation, 40 years of, of abortions, it's just impossible to conceive of the, the amount of bloodshed. And he's looking at the same thing here. This one here, she had, and I believe this, this is the Babylon, the great, this is the, the religious realm of the false prophet. Everything that he's been putting together, the religion, um, this is, you know, their fall. God pours out his wrath upon that day, upon the religious Babylon, destroys it. And then Revelation, Revelation 18 talks about economic Babylon, everything else falling apart. In verse 9, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her, and they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour thy judgment is come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And the merchants of these things which were made by made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the companies and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. And so again, you know, don't, Scratch your head saying, I don't understand everything here. You're not supposed to. You're we're supposed to get sort of snapshots of what's happening in the last days and how it's going to fall apart. I mean, it's much worse than going to the stores and realizing this is the 30th day you've gone and there's still no toilet paper in the shelves. It's going to be that bad, but it's going to be that bad with everything else. You know, we just got a small, small taste test of the panic with just one pestilence. Amen. And the Bible says in these last days it's going to be dozens of pestilences and dozens of 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 uh, pestilences of, of bugs and pestilences of diseases. It's going to be a, a terrible world. And then there's two incredible feasts in Revelation 19. And just see if you can catch some of the patterns here. In verse 7, it starts off with rejoicing. The believers are saying, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. So when we get raptured, we're going to go to heaven while all hell is breaking out on earth. And we're going to go to what's called the marriage supper of the lamb. It says, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he saith unto me, these things are true sayings of God. And so again, when we get raptured, where are we going to be for seven years while all hell is breaking out? We're going to be uh, with Jesus, and he's going to be rewarding us for our righteousness. And it says in verse 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, but we're going to talk about it more next page. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That'll be us. We're going to be coming back with Jesus on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls, the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses. And of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And so there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb, which will be a rejoicing time. And there's going to be the supper of the great God, a time of judgment. This is the battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be invited to the meal, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you have to be saved before the Lord comes in order to make it to the rapture. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get saved as soon as possible to make your calling and election sure you don't want to be left behind. You might end up at the supper of the great God. And then another interesting point that I want to mention happens in verses 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on a horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both, the beast and the false prophet, were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now some people believe a thing called annihilation, that when people are cast into 
perdition, they're cast into the lake of fire, they cook, they fizzle and pop, and then they cease to exist, and the torture doesn't last forever. So hang on to that thought. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. This is the battle of Armageddon. All those armies that gathered around Israel were slain in a moment, which sword proceeded out of the mouth of Jesus, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And that's when Jesus conquers the world by force and institutes a reign of peace. So let's take a look at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, we talked about the rapture of Jesus Christ being secret and silent, and there's a trump. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, they actually do use the word revelation in the Bible to describe it. Romans 2, 5. But after thy hardest and impenitent heart, you treasure up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And that's talking about when Jesus comes to dish out justice. 1 Peter 1, 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to come to save the earth. Luke 17, 29, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, judgment in a day, and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And so that term, revelation and revealed, that's actually a biblical term. Rapture, we sort of uh, tweaked that one. We uh, adopted that term, but the revelation of Jesus Christ is definitely called the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not a happy time to support your Christian. First Thess Second Thessalonians chapter 1 talks a little bit more about it. I want you to hear from other perspectives. You know, we're reading it from John. Now let's go to Paul. In Second Thessalonians 1, he says in verse 6, seeing it's a righteous thing with God to pay back tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, he's going to take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So again, he's describing the same thing. When Jesus comes, there is going to be great bloodshed and judgment. But for those who are saved, it's going to be a, a glorious day. And in Matthew 24, Matthew talks about this as well. Actually, Jesus, Matthew records it for us. In verse 27, it says, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So he's not talking about the secret side of rapture. He's not talking about the thief in the night. He's talking about, look at me. We're going to see Jesus. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, this is the revelation. And he shall send his angels with a great shout of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Now here's what's interesting. There is going to be a resurrection on that day. So many times people have read this passage here that says, after the tribulation, Jesus is going to come, and there's going to be a gathering of his elect from the four winds. And they figure he's talking about the rapture. But, of course, the rapture is quite clearly a thief in the night. Secret, silent, Jesus doesn't come to the earth, doesn't land. And, uh, and so I can see how they can get that confused. They read this passage here, and they think it's talking about the rapture, but it's not talking about the rapture. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus, and there's going to be people who died in those seven years during the tribulation, he's going to resurrect those believers and he's going to gather them out and give them uh, resurrected bodies. Questions before we go? Yes. Can you hear me, Pastor? I can. Hello? Yeah. Um, what, um, I've never known what that verse is talking about where it's for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. How, how would you interpret that you know i think he's actually he's quoting he's quoting proverbs proverbs uh, mentions that verse oops but um he i think he's also making a subtle reference to the supper of the great god where god invites all the birds to come 
and eat of the flesh of the, uh, of the okay thank you that that fits so he's kind of almost even though revelation hadn't been written at that point um he's yep. kind of anticipating or, or uh, yeah that's that would make complete sense um yeah. thank you even, fantastic yeah I didn't, even, I didn't even put that together until you asked me that question suddenly it made sense you know yeah that's, and it's really it's extraordinary that jesus should have said that before john wrote it and um wow i mean that's that's truly astonishing um thank you <laughs> but what i love is it all fits in like a glove it you does. don't have to try yeah. hard to fit in or try and push it through a square you know what yeah. i mean as yeah Mm. yeah you're not sort of shoehorning it it, it actually it's Lovely. like cinderella's foot <laughs> it fits yeah. it fits really well perfect yeah, mm. yeah. And something i've noticed is if you have a question challenge it bring it up pull up all the scriptures yeah. and usually you'll see where your misunderstanding was if there was a misunderstanding yeah. and so again yeah. i always say the bible can handle hard questions bring your hard questions amen Good question. That's a brilliant. I mean, I never understood that. No, it, it just made sense all of a sudden as soon as you brought it to my attention. Mm. I just thought, oh, I wonder, if, I wonder if I should remove yeah. that verse and just jump on to verse 29. But I'll just <laughs> yeah, let's just pretend it's not there. <laughs> yeah. It didn't seem relevant yeah. at the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you. You're welcome. So after the tribulation and Jesus comes out at the end of the tribulation, then we have the millennium. That's a fancy word, uh, probably a it's a Greek word. That's right. It's a Greek word because I'm not sure. The word in Greek is kilia. I think it's a Latin term, which means basically a thousand years, millennium. Revelation chapter 20. And I'll read this. And, and I want you to understand many people don't believe there's going to be a 1,000 year reign of Jesus. And I want you to read this and say, where can they not see it? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years okay so now we don't we have the, the chief cause of distraction the chief mm -hmm. cause of misery we've been blaming him for years the devil made me do it okay he's out of the way he's going to be in a pit cast him into the bottomless pit shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled after mm -hmm. that he must be loosed a little season and i saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So I think Paul mentions we're going to be reigning with Christ. It's right here during the millennium. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be scattered across the earth, reign, you know, ruling over cities, states, countries. We're going to be diff given different levels of, of, of responsibility depending on our walk with God. And it says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Um, I think it's on Isaiah. He talks about that when he's reigning from Jerusalem, that he will cause it to not reign to the nations that don't tithe. You know, so, so it's, it's actually, you know, so it talks more about, you know, the, the reign of, of peace that Jesus has. That, um, you know, with, with the devil out of the way and with righteousness being encouraged, you know, there's still going to be naughty people. I mean, even though people see Jesus on TV, they're not going to be giving their lives to God. It's hard to imagine that they'll have all knowledge and mm -hmm. still live um, disobedient lives. And so, um, so there's more detail on the millennium reign of Jesus and other passages of the Bible. I probably, in, in future versions of this, which will be three hours long, I'll have another page quoting those passages let's see where can were I ask we another, sorry yeah. could, could i just ask another question yes um about kind of bodies so the um if i've got this right so the are we saying that the the believers who were previously taken to be with the lord and had the marriage supper and then come back Oh no, hang on. And then which had not worshipped the beat. Well, hang on. No, because the the souls that had been beheaded and which hadn't worshipped the beast, they were people that presumably 
came to faith afterwards. And because what I was thinking was like, if the believers have been snatched up and then they get their resurrection bodies, so then they'd be coming back with non-dying resurrection bodies. But then everybody that was on the earth already and had never been snatched up, they would like be having children and dying in a normal sort of way, maybe. And then you'd have two different kinds of bodies on the earth. But then if if they um, if these are actually the faithful who went through the tribulation but didn't give in that's a different set of people isn't it it you is what i mean I, I think you just you mentioned them in particular i think just to make sure that everyone understands that those who got saved after the rapture will be resurrected and enjoying the rapture the millennium with those who came back with jesus because we're going to be coming back with jesus on white horses so we're going to be coming back too so all the believers, all saved believers will be down on the earth reigning. We're going to be scattered across the earth ruling and trying to, you know, make sure justice and righteousness are, are being executed. And we're going to rework all of David Attenborough's videos and get rid of evolution. Oh, man. <laughs> all the science we had them by hand and fix them with whiteout. All the authors. <laughs> Wow. let's see and so let's see we've gone to verse 5 and the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection right now that's often a cause for question because huh? people have been resurrected before this and people are going to be resurrected after so I, I actually talk about that so hang on to your questions about that one for the moment okay this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So I see a lot of thousand years here. I see, it looks quite literal. Now, there's lots of pictorial things, lots of metaphors in the book of Revelation, but this thousand years looks quite literal. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. There's going to be plenty of people vulnerable to him because they just don't believe. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So again, the beast and the false prophet are still burning a thousand years later. So they didn't sizzle and pop. The judgment is eternal. So it's so important that we reach souls. We don't want anyone to have to suffer eternal flames. Yeah. I'm sure it would be according to their, their, their sin. But, uh, but it, anything would be worse than going to heaven. And then we're wrapping it up. Okay, after, after that 1,000 year reign and the devil's uh, last uh, rebellion, then we have the great white throne judgment where everyone is resurrected mm -hmm. for judgment. Verse 11, Revelation 20, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That needs to be made into a, a sign and hung in every household. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we can all seek to fulfill that. I mean, if you just look at the consistency of the scripture, it's, re it's in remarkable. It's ridiculously remarkable. It's incredible how different authors from different walks of life, from different generations can write and all these things fit together like a glove. I mean, if I was, I mean, if I had to choose between this and Buddha, I mean, it would definitely be. There's just absolutely no denying that this here has so much more miraculous harmony through thousands of years. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
Paul will talk on the great white throne from other passages. Romans 14, 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why do you set it not your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Hmm. And 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to, to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Hmm. And Ecclesiastes 12, 13 in the Old Testament says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Yeah. And now here's the big picture. This is what we've all been looking for. Let me see it on one page. Okay, so we're looking at using the book of Revelation as a bit of a guide. We see that there's the church age where we are now. Now the next big thing on the schedule, there's nothing standing between this and that. Is the rapture of the church. It can happen before this lesson's over. It can happen before tomorrow morning. We don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to be a thief in the night when you weren't looking for it. And then after the rapture of the church, we have the seven years of tribulation. The first three and a half of years will, will be trouble with secular society. There's going to be this king, and there's going to be the governments of the earth, and they're going to try to bring peace. And the two witnesses are going to be going around bringing truth, and they're going to be fighting. People are going to be believing, and they're going to be trying to kill people who, who don't want to do this. And then halfway through the tribulation, that great king is going to say, look, I'm, I'm not just a great king, but I'm, I'm the Messiah. I'm, I'm Jesus. And so he's going to go to the temple and present himself as God. And the Bible says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, run for the hills. And so the second three and a half years of trouble will be with the beast and the false prophet. And that's when the 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be, will be bearing witness to the truth. And then we have at the end of the seven years, a revelation of Jesus Christ. So the beginning of the tribulation, rapture of the church, the end of the, of the tribulation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, Armageddon, the great battle. And then after the battle of Armageddon, we have 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ. Mm. Followed by a final rebellion when he lets the devil out again, followed by the great white throne judgment. So this is sort of how I see it, and I feel pretty confident. I mean, I've been believing this for 30 years, and the more I read my Bible, the more it seems to be set in stone. I've had to tweak a few things and get them back in order, but I, I believe that this is uh, the most accurate chart that I can put together. Now, there's a guy named Clarence Larkin. If you look him up on Google, he has some incredible charts. He believes quite a bit uh, the same thing as I do. He spends a lot more time looking at the prophecies of Ezekiel and Jeremiah mm. and Isaiah. Um, but in the big picture, I believe he's, he's pretty close to exactly what I believe. The rapture followed by the revelation. Any questions or any comments or any observations on this big picture? I think, Pastor, uh, that, that um, the book of Revelation is, is misunderstood by many people. Um, I know there's some churches that have a look at the book. Um, but I think it's a book that's worth reading and understanding. But I think it's got to be read more than one time for people to really understand what the Revelation is all about. Um, yeah. I know that my daughter Jennifer, she's read this book about three times already, and she finds it quite fascinating. And I, I take on your, your, uh, with you, and I just love it. This is one of my other favorite books in the Bible. I've got many favorite books in the Bible, but um, Revelation is, is the one that I enjoy reading very much. But I think, Pastor, if we have a study Bible with a commentary and down the back, down the front, like notes or something like that, but something that's close to the truth, I think we have to read the scriptures and read the chapters and read the notes for we to get a better understanding of what this book is all about. And what, what you have been, what you taught tonight was a, an excellent lesson. And I, I thank you for that. And um, I hope that people will will read this book more often and you get the understanding that we got tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Someone's going to say something as well. Okay. I, th I think it definitely will bring a, a reminder of, of the importance of salvation. Um, but again, I just probably emphasize spending more time. I'll get to the question. I, I would like to recommend though that, that we do spend more time reading the epistles on how to live. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably where we have the most 
need at the moment. You're trying to figure out how to live right. So but again, you know, every once in a while, I mean, definitely don't neglect Revelation, you know, read it, read it once a year or once every two years and make sure it just kind of stays fresh or maybe find it on a Bible program, let it read it to you out loud and listen to it. It doesn't take long at all for 22 chapters. But uh, yeah, I recommend taking notes, but even, even with all the note taken I've done, I have to confess I haven't understood it all. And I'm happy with that. I'm content. I can, I can be content not understanding everything. I got the big picture. <laughs> you must be born again, you know. Amen. So very good, very, very good. We really should, um, keep, you know, some people actually avoid this book, though. So that's, it's, that's a good reason why you should mention that, Brother Brian. Some people do try to avoid the book because it is kind of dark and scary. And, um, and it's meant to be that way. It's supposed to remind us that, that, that it, the loving God who's so patient with us is a just God. And he will be pouring out his wrath one day. And we don't want to be there to, mm -hmm. on, to be on the receiving side. And, and we can. We, Christians can get, slate, can get lazy and we can turn our back on God. And we don't want to do that. Now, I heard another question. Uh, anyone else have a question or an observation? Um, I lost connection when um, when we were on the, the the screen about the the woman giving birth <laughs> um, okay. and the dragon. I I lost a few minutes at that point because I don't know why, but it all disappeared. So yeah. I don't know what you said okay. about that. Yeah, pretty much. It just um, is letting us know about these Christian Jewish believers who are the fruits of Israel. But you know, this first part here, this, this picture up here, where about she, talks about the there. woman. She's still there. Are you still there, Sister Louise? Sorry, yes, that's the, that's the bit that I missed, yeah. The, this, this first passage up here, this is really an interesting piece of, uh, of text up here, because this woman giving birth to a man-child, and the demon, the devil, the serpent ready to consume it, and then um, the waters saving it and the earth hiding it. This not only is this a, a, a telling of the story of Jesus, but it's also a telling of the birth of Israel. You know, Moses was cast upon the waters. You know, he was born and the devil tried to kill him and he was cast on the waters and he was saved and he actually came back and, and delivered Israel. It's a type of, um, it's a type of, um, the, the church in, in Revelation type of you know, this, 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 the themes. You know, Jesus, his life parallels the, 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 his believers, you know, his people. We see so much of a parallel in the life of Jesus and the life of the believers. <clears throat> so it's actually, you can read the story and see Moses. You can read, just see the story, you can see Israel trying to come out of um, Egypt, you know, the devil is ready to consume it, you know, but, but the water's open and, and they walk through on dry land and Moses gets to be that man child. So it's just really, really interesting. But over, but the big picture that is, is pointing to basically is the fact that um, the, the dragon was not only since he couldn't get the, the get the man child, he's actually trying to kill the Jews. Mm. And, uh, and, and for three and a half years, they pretty much uh, were Many of them are fleeing him over that three and a half years of the um, tribulation. So definitely, uh, there's a lot of interpretations in that little passage there. Thank you. Now, something I want to bring up, I, I rose a question earlier about how many resurrections are there? Remember talking about the first resurrection in Revelation 20? We see Jesus is resurrected from the dead in Matthew 28. We see the rapture, dead believers and the living believers resurrected. At the rapture and then we see the two witnesses resurrected in mid-tribulation we see believers at the end of the tribulation being resurrected in revelations 14 and matthew 24 and then we also see believers at the end of the millennium being resurrected so how many resurrections are there he says blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection well this question actually came up earlier i can't remember i uh Someone brought it to my attention because I never really thought about that before. But as I looked into it, I find that there's only two resurrections. Revelation 26 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. So the first resurrection, the resurrection of life, is every resurrection for believers, no matter when it happens. Because Jesus 
was the first one to go in the resurrection and we are following behind him just like jesus went into the water first and we're being baptized we're joining jesus in the water moses went into the dead sea and israel followed him and they were saved so everyone who's resurrected after jesus are entering into his resurrection now the second resurrection is not called the second resurrection it's not called the resurrection of death it's basically called the second death because it will be devoid of the life of god we're going to be separated from god and we'll even be exiled from the presence of god in the lake of fire forever so it's not the resurrection of life and the resurrection of death the bible only talks about the resurrection of life and the second death but those who suffer eternal consequences of having disobeyed God, they will be given a resurrection body, but it won't be for the sake of uh, enjoying God's presence. So there's two resurrections, and that's why Revelation 26 talked about the first resurrection just before the, at the end of the millennium. So that's another little nugget to take home from this study here. So it was a good handful there. I hope that um, I, even if everyone's not fully convinced on everything, at least you got something to look at. I'll make this presentation. I'm going to upload it onto um, Northern Beaches uh, prayer and fasting page. So you can look at it later and study it for yourself if you like and build upon your research, you know. And there may be a couple of things here and there where I may have not been as precise as I could have been. You might say, here's something you could have done a little bit more precise and so i appreciate that i'll never i'll never rebuke you for correcting me the bible says correct a wise man he'll love you Amen. correct a fool <laughs> he'll hate you so i'm always open for um always open for um fine tuning amen so th i'll make that available this is the last page and i hope you guys enjoy that again if, even now if you have any questions you're more than welcome to ask questions let's see Okay, I think others have also had problems with connections too, so it looks like you're not the only one. Let's see. But if all hearts are clear, we are after I nine o'clock. I do want to say something. Ah, Sister Anne's got you, something you to share. Mention, but I, want, I didn't want to um, get in the way of anyone asking questions. I want everyone okay. to have their questions, you know, mm -hmm. um, said. Uh, one thing you mentioned was that we need to reach as many souls as possible you know mm -hmm. and something that came in today that i was um reading and that was um that there's going to be a new net legislation and um, we could see a new legislation in victoria where if uh, christians would be jailed for 10 years for attempting to convert people did anyone read about that no no, no i haven't seen oh, it. wow years ago, huh? I, I sent that to the pastor to look at, but it was um, one of the guys from the Christian Democrats. Is that right, Don? Am I, say, am I right in saying that? Could be. The Who brought the attention? Yeah. Uh, Lyle. Lyle? Or? Oh, yeah, Lyle Shelton? Yeah. I think he's from a, a Christian lobbying group, which is a good one. Yeah, and he was it's... saying that they wanted to try and pass it in Victoria. Yeah, they want to pass a law Ooh. that if anyone tries to convert a gay or lesbian person from their sexual preference, uh -huh. They ask you, then you can be liable. And if they later on claim mental damage from it, they can actually uh, send you to prison for it. So, and I'm sure they'll keep yeah. expanding it. You know, it'll come to the come to the point where if you mention Jesus to someone, if you're talking to people about Jesus and the gay person he overhears you, that might be enough to cause. But I, I, I can imagine, and I, I'm trying to exercise faith here. I can imagine that won't pass because it's so bizarre. I can only. Yeah.